Okay. So I just want to thank some of the people who have been um, behind the scenes for years and some new faces too. Um, we want to thank Scott Jones for uh, finding the need to celebrate functional pottery. Um, he was a person in the chapter of the Pennsylvania to celebrate this. No one is highlighting functional pottery anymore. And so he started this um, 28 years ago. Uh, and then, so he ran it for a little or just one year, I'm not sure. But then Jean came in, Jean Lehman ran the show for at least 17 years and just really promoted it and got it its recognition that it deserved. Um, then Wes Wilkin, who has been our editor at large, and Margaret, I see, hi Lois. I see Margaret in here too, and Margaret bought or brought the uh, to the opening. It's always got beautiful flowers and it greets everybody to the opening. So there it is. Hi, Margaret. Uh, then we have a brand new person who, without Reagan Lehman, again, no relation to Kevin or Jean, but we found this wonderful person who just happens to do marketing and said, I'm all in. And she's the one who created this beautiful new website. Uh, she did the whole Shopify. She did all of this. And she was working full-time pandemic, and she still found time to do this for us. So we really thank Reg again. And then again, we thank Julia for really promoting the heck out of this on Instagram and um, sort of the, the Facebook issues that we were dealing with. But we had like maybe 400 uh, Instagram followers and now we're over a thousand. So that really, really helped. I think I'll just keep strictly functional in the spotlight for years to come. So thank you. All right. All right. So Julie is a utilitarian potter and professor. She teaches ceramics at the University of Montana, Missoula. She attended the New York State College of Ceramics at Alfred. From the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, she's interested in a wide range and involved in a wide range in the field of ceramics, included, including making pottery during exhibitions, studying ceramics from other cultures, writing about pottery, and also mentoring emerging artists, which is something we definitely need. She's dedicated to education, whether it be in the traditional college campus or a craft school or an art center. She taught She's exhibited your ceramic. Julia Galloway, thank you. <laughs> it's very funny. It's so quiet. Cool. Um, I have to say, I just love seeing your faces because I've been spending so much time with your work over the past six weeks and a little bit more than that. And I think first off, I just would like to thank you for applying. It's a pain in the ass. It costs money and it's a crapshoot. And, um, and I think as we start to sell more and more directly through social media, uh, the role of juried shows is really changing. And I think they're still important. I think it's important that people in the field say, this is what we think good work is. Because we know, you know, we know more than people who are sort of quickly swiping by images on their phone. So I really appreciate you guys supporting uh, uh, curated, curated shows. Um, <clears throat> I think what I'm going to do is sort of scroll through the show like we were walking through the gallery and talk a little bit about the jury process. Kevin is going to uh, chat area because that's a little bit more than I can quite finagle at once. Um, <clears throat> but I thought we'd sort of walk through the show and then I thought if people had questions, especially about other people's work who's here, like, I think that could be super interesting to say, you know, Mike, how did you get that slip plate or, you know, whatever that is. Um, I'd love it if there could be crosstalk. Crosstalk, yeah, okay. 
So um, hold on one sec, here we go. What's that? Yeah, the email that we sent to Jill, we could forward it to Josh. So <clears throat> I just love jurying this year. I love being asked to jury and uh, it was really, I have to say it's, it was, because honestly, there was a ton of really great work. And so when I started looking at uh, POTS to jury, I kind of broke them down into different categories. And some was just really looking at techniques like I didn't want to have all wheel thrown or all cast or all wood fire or to get a variety of aesthetics and trying to leave my aesthetic the door so that it wasn't so obvious. Do you know, I was, I was, I tried to be very skeptical of um, my, what I think is beautiful, do you know? Um, I try to be a little, try to be a little bit broader of that. And there was some work that was, is not my aesthetic at all, but I thought this is really strong work. So I'm going to put it in that, um, uh, during discipline. It was like a muscle. I had to kind of develop it. And, uh, so often if it didn't love work, I kind of would keep it on the back burner and uh, revisit it a couple of times and figure out if it was just my own bias that I wasn't aware of or if the work just wasn't that strong yet. Like what was I reacting to there? So I think trying to get some variation of uh, techniques and then forms, there's a shockingly few teapots, honestly. You know, teapots used to be like rage. It was like, like a virus in our field, like everybody made teapots and they really have dropped by the wayside. So trying to have some teapots. I have to say a gazillion wood-fired pitchers a lot of wood-fired and soda-fired pictures going on right now. And that made that sort of area of um, like uh, atmospheric firing, that was tremendously competitive because there was so much of it, right? Um, and then I think like we're looking such an odd thing I'd never seen it before. And it's very unusual to see something completely new. And so I think things that are a little bit odd moved up uh, on the list a little bit more quickly because they had a little bit less competition and they also were sort of finding out something about um, a variety of techniques, a variety of forms, a, varieties of, a variety of functions, and, um, and then trying to also balance um, a little bit, have I seen this work a ton or not? Is it moving? Like those kinds of questions. That wasn't a decision-making factor, but it was something I thought about. Super clear. I'm in energy to make a little place where a cup would park. You know, that's like kind of sweet to me. I think that's sort of endearing. So <clears throat> after, uh, so when during, you know, it, it's, so, you know, I had to get down to 100. That's what I heard, I had to get down to 100. And so, it was pretty easy until about 150. And then at 150, it started to get really, really hard. And it took tremendous discipline. And some things were like if, if somebody had two pieces in, that was a little bit easier to pull out, right? So there's only a handful. Of That's sort of the easiest way to, to uh, pull out work because somebody's still represented. So then I started to think a lot about uh, ideas were sort of in addition to craftsmanship and function and um, how much I knew the work already before I saw it and how much it was surprising me and also I think I thought quite so to have a sense an uplifting sense and um, I really wanted it to be uh, sort of joyous and uh, I wanted to be delighted and that didn't mean that the work had to be highly decorated. I just uh, was paying a little bit more attention to that than perhaps I had in the past. Because I had to, like, when I had to uh, pull out 10 pots, it was just really painful by then. And you just, uh, you know, you just have to kind of suffer through it, honestly. So uh, then I started to look at 
um, the whole show overall, what was missing, what wasn't represented, where I thought the field was going, where I wanted to push the field. Also was a, wanted to be aware of uh, showing work that I hadn't seen before. So this could be like somebody who wanted to bring them in. You know, when I was coming up and building my career, strictly fun maker. Like when you got into strictly functional, you told everybody. Or you really wanted to think about um, emerging people or um, people who are a little bit more on the fringe. And that often meant maybe they were not um, tapped into a really developed educational system. Because um, then they didn't quite have the leg up of school. So I thought about that. Dane, I don't know if you're on. But thanks for sending me this teapot. And I loved getting it. Can you guys see Dane's pot or is the stripe kind of covering it? So good. So Isn't good. <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> um, that I noticed is once I'm really apparent that we weren't gonna have a face-to-face -face show is that I started to think about these pots really differently. And I want to uh, do Instagram posts on all the pots uh, in replacement of doing a gallery talk. And I just felt like I wanted to make it worthwhile for the potters to apply. Like you went to all this work, it's not a face-to-face -face show, you're shipping the work directly from your studio, what can I do that really would make it like this is worth it? You know, because you guys, you're really good. You don't need one more show on your resume. These are really good pots. So, um, <clears throat> so that's how I kind of got involved with this uh, posting on Instagram every day and um, having to think about pots in a short way, right? We don't have a lot of words and in a way that was, um, could be interesting to other people and sort of comparing the pots you guys, the couplings on the screen right now are purely alphabetical. Um, you know, when I was working on Instagram, <clears throat> I was pairing them up based on ideas, either similars or opposites. So <clears throat> it just looks a little different here. But somehow having to write these essays, these brief essays, and um, researching all of you so I could get quotes from your websites, that was really fabulous. Um, like, I feel like I know you guys much more than you know me now, because I've been stalking you for like six weeks and um, going to your Instagram page and Googling you and finding out what you make. And, um, and so the Instagram posts, I think, were really engaging for me and curious and funny. And um, Jacob's Cups here, Jacob's Cups got a little bit shortchanged in the uh, Instagram posts because I coupled them with the um, Rocket Man the astronaut cup because this one looks so atmospheric like the milk but I like that idea so much that I forgot to talk about Jacob's cup itself and the reason why I put Jacob's cup in the show because there was a lot the surface path of the flame of the wood coming basically coming out of the handle and how this was an incidental decoration which completely be a brilliant kiln stacker. So, <clears throat> uh, so I have to say that the, the posts were just fabulous to write and um, were a, a little bit funny or a little bit nostalgic or a little bit sad or a little bit delightful. And it made me feel like I um, knew you all, which I guess in some ways, pottery is still kind of a big family. And I don't want to get sentimental, but it's still a little bit true you know? So some of you guys, I just would cold call. What are you trying to say here? And people were just right on it. Like, oh, well, let me send you this. So this is what I'm trying to say. Or, uh, <clears throat> and I really appreciated that. You know, taking a cold call from a juror of a show is, well, that's kind of a trip. So <clears throat> anyways, uh, so that's sort of how the juring went. And I would say, So we're down to R. 
uh, I have pulled out some for the awards. And awards, <clears throat> but that doesn't mean they're second place awards. Awards are kind of weird like that, you know. So fortunately, uh, Kevin categories for the awards and that was really helpful and uh so so geez i just love comparing pots right like when you have one you have one and when you have two you have a conversation and something gets much more interesting. so it's fabulous my students follow along and uh mostly they tease me about typos but they did have to vote on my favorites. And uh, I decided that if they came to a really clear favorite, we could do a student. Honestly, they, they, didn't, they didn't get there. They felt very passionate and they weren't willing to sort of give up their own opinion. So sadly, no student award this year. So. Hmm. I don't know, Molly, what you do for a living, but I'm sure impressed by your um, ability to focus. <laughs> and I don't know if Lars is on the line, but Lars, we went to school together about 50 million years ago. It's sure nice to see your pots. So <clears throat> we're kind of coming up on the award winners here. And uh, it was great to be able to add four extra awards this year. And uh, uh, Shanna was awarded by <clears throat> from Amico with a, a kind of tremendous use of color. And uh, Mike got the Ceramics Monthly Award. And uh, Nolan got the John Brown Purchase Award. You guys, the awards are hard because <clears throat> you want to award work that's strong, but also you want to award some work that's emerging. Do you know, like there's sort of this balance between uh, wanting to support emerging, emerging people up with awards and then also, you know, awards that are really strong, you know, and um, so it's that's sort of a tricky thing, you know. So uh, this is Lillian's fabulous teapot and this very funny photo she sent me of these are her neighbor's kids uh, using her teapot um, in the yard. How great is that? And uh, Deborah's a full, uh, highly decorated dish. Um, you know, in my juror statement, I wrote quite a bit about uh, things that I saw in common with the show and some things that really popped out at me. And some is there's a real resurgence or interest in modern design, kind of early modern design. Um, there was not as much slip casting or digital printing as I was expecting. So I wonder if Strictly Functional still has, has somehow a bit of a reputation about not being that, right, which I think would be kind of a shame. Um, and I have to say, honestly, that like red underglaze is all the rage and there's so much red underglaze there over everything. It's, it's a little surprising. There's something about that level of, um, uh, you know, our sort of industry is supporting us so well now. We can get almost any color and underglaze or uh, techniques. You know, there's so much available to us on YouTube that now it's much more about what are you going to do with that rather than can you actually do it. And that seems to be a big change. Um, this is Alex's, and he got the Rethinking Process Award, which is a totally made up award. But Alex pours his, I'm not totally sure, Alex, how you do this, but it has to do with cut up pieces of glaze that you put back together. So maybe after this talk, you can explain us to that a little bit. But I just couldn't believe somebody would do that. And I loved how it's sort of completely chaotic and a little bit organized, and it seems that uh, center vase is tremendously serious, right? It's almost like um, Lucy Ree or something. And then these very odd colors that have fallen upon it. You know, it's a fab fabulous contradiction in this piece. And one uh, of <clears throat> the great uh, divas of decoration in our field, Darrow. And then uh, these are some cuffs, uh, Jesse's printed cuffs. And I just think they're uh, just such a, um, they have such a sense of the hand in them for being something which is made quite mechanically. That's why Julia. they never got on here. Or do you want to take it now? Sure. Chris, Chris yeah. has a question. 
yeah, I have a question for Jesse's work. It's just about like the process about um, like running from like, say like the design portion uh, through the, like the, the finished object. Um, because, well, like you said, like um, there is something that, uh, that it doesn't necessarily feel printed. Um, and I'm very curious about, yeah, just the process. Hey, Chris, you know what let's do? I only have about four more slides, so let's get through them. And then I'll just put up the screen that has all of the images on it. And then if people have questions about specific images, what do you think about that? Perfect. And um, that'll give Jesse a minute to think about how to answer the question. Good? Okay. Fantastic. Nice though, huh? Um, okay, so Dryden's, uh, <clears throat> I wrote about this in Dryden's um, uh, uh, Instagram post about how the cup is so much about touch and then to have his hand in the image is like um, making that even stronger. And it made me just think about the power of images. It's really, it's really pretty amazing. And um, Megan Thomas, maybe some of the most popular pots I've seen in a long time. And um, that charming image of her holding the birds up to the birds. So uh, it's really very beautiful pots here. So um, <clears throat> this is uh, Rachel's work, and um, these are called um, seed. Rachel, jump in. Seed, 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 help me, Rach. Seed banks. Thank you. They're called seed banks, and so seeds from those specific areas uh, would be harvested, put in these banks, and then buried in the ground and um, for futures to come to ensure some um, biodiversity. And uh, I myself am working with um, sort of larger political issues uh, in my own work and how they can be married with pottery. And I, so I think that what Rachel's doing is super interesting. And they're also incredibly beautiful, beautiful little pots. Um, <clears throat> I loved this pot by Emily because, you know, five years ago, I would have thought this was done by somebody with no skill, but obviously it's so clearly done with somebody with tremendous skill. The de-skilling is somehow setting us free from ourselves. Mm. So, uh, and is this a labor of love? I mean, I love it when I see work like this and I'm like, oh, Ben is as obsessed as I am. Like, oh, yes, he is. Like, look at that candelabra, that's a craziness. And then I have to say that this, uh, this actually got <clears throat> the first place award, this extremely beautiful uh, vase by Adam Spector. And he just sent me this kind of wonderful video of taking the mold apart, which has a wonderful kind of aha moment in it. So I thought I'd share that with you. But this vase is a combination of um, contemporary nostalgia and, uh, and uh, high tech and low tech. And um, <clears throat> there we go. Look at that beautiful thing. And its vision is incredibly clear. And uh, so um, I thought that's, there we go. So. I think that was your that was your walk around the gallery, and uh, I think we can. <clears throat> so this is basically the show, and we can kind of keep it like this so you guys can see the work, or we can go back to um, seeing everybody's faces. Kevin, whatever you'd like to do. This works for me. So you guys, that was about uh, 20 minutes, about uh, half 20 minutes, half an hour. And I would love it if you had some questions for each other or um, for me, um, this, is, uh, this is our time together. Can we turn it over to uh, Jessie if she's with us? Yeah, I'm here. Um, so yeah, as far as, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, as far as the, the printing process, part of why it doesn't read as clearly as being printed is just that the, the printer is a really fine nozzle size, so it's only like 1.2 millimeters. Um, and then I'm printing the walls of the, of the cups and casting the bottom. So I think a lot of times with 3D printed work, Maybe you'll see that the the base you're kind of restricted by a flat base because it has to you know it's confined to kind of the printer bed. Um, but by putting kind of an open cylinder wall on the on the plaster, 
I can attach kind of a cast cast bottom to a printed side. Um, and then, yeah, and with the handles, I'm printing them as a prototype, but then slip casting them because um, I couldn't print them in a single piece. I have to print them in two halves, make molds, and put it together. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. what about the surfacing there? What's that? The surfacing, like, um, like after you have the object, how, like, how are you surfacing them? Yeah, it's just um, layers of underglaze, um, just kind of building up layers using the geometry kind of as a guideline and then kind of scratching away or kind of wearing away on the edges and that's and then just clear glaze um i had a question for rachel about the seed bank um, can everyone hear me yes okay um i really really love this and the concepts behind this um, cause I'm really into learning more about sustainability, but I just had a question. I read a bunch of stuff on the website about this project and do you, do you, uh, like dig it up later so you can plant the seeds and take them out or like, how does that work after they've been in the ground for however long? Yeah, thank you. Great question. So the seed banks are buried in the ground indefinitely. Um, and the idea is that they'll last longer than we will. And they become like a ecological indicator and also, also a cultural indicator. And what really remains is this kind of network of banks. Um, whoever buries them has, like gives me back a bunch of information um, about the, plants of the seeds um, are really important to that ecology and then the cultural significance. So really what's remaining is this kind of um, awareness of their local ecology and then it's put on a public database that can be shared. Um, oh, cool. So it's really an act of giving these seeds to the future. The thing about seeds is um, even though the banks are designed to keep them dry. So to stay viable, they need to be dry. They need to be, there's need to be low humidity and no sunlight. Which is 50 to 60 degrees. And then they're sealed with beeswax with a screw top cap. So no water can get in. But even then, like any seed has its own um, coated, um, viability rate in the DNA. So if they were to be unburied, uh, it's especially very unlikely that they would be viable, but they still can extract um, scientific, like they can still extract information from those seeds. And also just like the cultural significance of uh, what kind of seed this was and who buried it and why. Yeah, uh, thanks. It's very like ritualistic. Oh, sorry. Yeah. interesting things I've seen uh, from my perspective as an Indian uh, whose seeds of rice disappeared because of the Green Revolution in the 60s. You know, we were famine. So it's, thing could survive that. This was just a miracle process. And emotionally, uh, you know, uh, stirred by seeing. So thank you. Why don't you say your, uh, uh, check out your project if you want. Any other questions? Comments? Uh, well, one of the things I'm super struck by is, is still, objects, conversations outside of utility into our daily lives. That one of the things that should lie close to our hearts as makers of objects would hopefully be um, how, how, to, how to bring conversations 
outside of materiality or utility into our work. Rachel's work is a pretty awesome example of that. Thank you. What other ones here do you see that with? Like when you look across this spit of all these pots we're looking at, where else do these pots take you? So um, pretty much talks about um, talks about that ability to bring conversations outside of outside of only function into the work without doubt um, I, there's there's not uh, that I can think of that um, that lies lies outside of that spectrum you know I think that I was thinking when I started you know we had this sort of conversation a little bit about the title strictly functional because in some ways that's that title is really of a place and time in our field right mm -hmm. and um, <clears throat> so I thought a ton about function like what are these actually functions because all these pots have two or three different functions in them and um, you know when I was uh, sort of growing up in the field um, there was many more techniques than there is now. And also that my understanding of function was extremely small. It was really limited. Um, and some was just being young and some was that my later then it's relaxed so much now. So I thought a lot about um, objects and really what the function is. And I was interested in works where the function is rooted in you you know how to, how utility was still such a key uh, part of that but it does seem amazing to me that in my lifetime we've really blown out what function means in sort of a fabulous way uh wesley's uh cups uh how it was just unabashedly of his time and his uh sort of viewpoint also just kind of wonderful hugs. And um, that this, these kind of mugs, talking about the uh, paint here, um, but uh, about how uh, Wesley's pots, there we go. Um, Wes Harvey's pots. Wes, are you on? And I think about how uh, making pre-existing pots and I just don't think that would have gone over very well when I went to school. So I love that now, You go ahead, Andrew. I think Andrew's cooking dinner. <laughs> there we go. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. I'm interested in your cups. Um, for this question, mainly because I feel like you're the only one that really uh, and um, I'm interested in why you chose to make a shelf for your cups and talk a little bit about the idea behind the shelf and what you think that shelf and that display is doing for that set of cups. Um, thanks. For, yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, it's doing um, several things, actually. Well, one is like, I mean, just to literally like, sort of like elevate the object. I mean, just sort of like to put it on a pedestal. It's almost like it, but also the object's its own space. So it's almost like those objects have their own domestic space. Um, but another thing, um, it's about... I guess for the most part, it's about um, putting that on a pedestal. So sort of like like the objects themselves are about they reference community um, in the way that like there's there's a motif that um, requires all four cups uh, for that motif to be completed, and and it's just a way to um, 
celebrate that or elevate the idea of community and uh, the role of individuals in that community. And yeah, that's it. Crickets, that was awesome. Who was doing the crickets? What's that all about? I don't know. <laughs> it just means I got a text. <laughs> it was very appropriate. There was like silence and then wait, what's happening? Perfect timing for that. Yeah. All these people, no other questions? Anything else we should uh, kind of check in about? Kind of scrolling through. Jim Connell, um, how many Wood fired pitchers, do you think you put into this show? Just a few, honestly. With that, was that suddenly there were all these sort of competing, you know? And so then it really pushed, uh, it just made it tremendously, tremendously. There's some here, it just made it really competitive with, for vases. Uh, so here and here's a, a nice a beautiful wood fire vase and you know it's hard because wood fire and atmospheric firing has such a strong um, effect on the work um, which may or may not be related to that uh, person's own how do I explain this um, uh, it may or may not be related to the person's own development as a maker so like I think with these bowls over here, how um, uh, Harvey, Harry, sorry, how Harry has loaded the work and how he's wadded it has really made the um, surface area very intent, have a great intent. So that made me very interested in that work. And the same here with these be really super beautiful um, vases of Susan's, these some of that in process picking on wood fire pictures a little bit because I used to make so many. <laughs> Linda Christensen years ago when she juried said that when when she was the juror she experienced everybody throwing wood fire um, pots into the uh, juried process and she didn't pick very many of them. So it's probably a mistake to um, think that the juror has a specific taste. I, well, one would hope, I mean, we hope as a juror that that's our job is to, super, is to sort of supersede ourselves, you know. Um, I also had sort of a goal of having a super diverse range of work. Um, so, uh, unfortunately there was enough applicants I could really do that. Mm -hmm. so, Excellent. Well, thanks to your um, critiques every night, I have been able to get a vast array of people interested in pots ah. because they're reading you. I mean, I don't know what they're following, but I've done my best because of these essays. And I will say that I read them late at night and then I send them off to whoever it is. And and I never thought of that and just for you know, bringing in this vastly shut up state over here uh, sometimes um, just reading that has been very refreshing very entertaining and very informative so thank you very much for that I think people don't realize how much content there is in pottery right you just got to kind of poke at it a little bit and it comes out in spades. Well, uh, the other thing I want to say about strictly functional is that there used to be, when I started to do ceramics, which was some time ago, the awful discussions between art and craft and seeing this array of everything, there's art, craft, technology, and the whole lot. So happy to see that in the show and have it, have it as I said, it's playing at night. I'm so relieved our field has sort of moved past being so binary. Hmm. You know. Kevin, what else you got? I see a little number up there. We just got a few more minutes. 
Yep, we have uh, Elizabeth has a question. Hi, I, I am interested in how much, how the pieces photographed affects the jurying process. Uh, Elizabeth, you're so right, right? Some is because when it, we were going to show something, I had to really think about that. But I do think that because of Instagram, the formality of the fade to black background is less important than it used to be. Like there's some cups in here somewhere that are on a, like a picnic bench or something. They're these sort of five-sided cups. And I have to say that that casualness to that image that I kind of appreciated. And um, it's distracting if too much of the content is the image rather than the piece itself. But for me, a little bit was helpful, you know? Um, but uh, the one thing that's a little tricky is now the fade to black is kind of down, done. Like people aren't using that as much. And then all white background is really popular right now. It's harder to work in an all white background. A lot of people are making white pots on a white background. And there's also sort of a trend right now for things to be overexposed. That's supposed to be attractive right now. Just put those two things together, like wear sunglasses to look at the work. Um, but uh, I, I, think, I think that I tried not to pay too much attention to it in the way that I know many people without uh, means or if they're not involved with the school or if they're isolated, they might not have a great photo set up. So I try not to pay too much attention to it. And I would say it often, the quality of the image helped more than it hurt. Does that answer your question? He's got a question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay, great. Um, you know, I have a question about function and how you saw the sort of contrast between function as a metaphor and pieces that were really meant to be utilized by people. Because I see an awful lot, my personally, I think of function more as a metaphor than a driver. Um, my customers almost never want to use the work that I make. And I just wondered how you saw that, uh, not just in terms of the pieces you selected, but in terms of the pieces that you saw. Yeah, yeah. Um, I saw very little work that I thought wasn't functional at all. Like almost none, I would say. I don't know if they were pulled out. Um, but I think his metaphor is really key. And I, I think, Timothy, honestly, that um, a lot of people who get my work don't actually use it either. And the function of it is kind of fantastical or the fantasy of supporting me as a potter or the fantasy of a life they would have if they used this cup. Do you know there's a lot of that? And I think that's not unlike a lot of objects that people buy. Like uh, I have shoes that I've only worn once. It's ridiculous, but true. Um, and, uh, but there's, but I still have them, right? Five years later, cause I sort of think like, yeah, I might, I might do that again, you know? Um, so I'm not totally answering your question, except for I think that um, in our day-to-day -day life, where um, pots are so cheap, like if you go and you buy some commercial work, it's so, so cheap that the handmade pots are elevated to have this really um, uh, broad, uh, sophisticated, and I would say metaphoric uh, uh, meaning. Well, not only that, I mean, it's like when people pay a certain amount, there's like there's an inverse relationship between price and desire to use. So mm -hmm. when you get to a certain price point, um, people just look at it and go, I would never use that. I'd be afraid that I broke it. And, you know, when you hear that enough times over enough years, you start rethinking the whole concept of what does function mean and what function are these people looking for? They clearly have a function in mind, but it's not the function that is the obvious one. Yeah, I think I've always felt like um, if you use my work or not, it's none of my business. <laughs> and I also felt like if you don't like my prices, that's none of my business either. <laughs> um, because I would never spend more than $20 on a bottle of wine, but I know people that would spend significantly more than that. Um, and I, so I feel like pricing is generational and pricing is, a, it's about all this other stuff that doesn't have anything to do with me as a maker. And I just try to stay out of that conversation altogether because 
because um, <clears throat> just because I wouldn't pay more than $20 for a bottle of wine doesn't mean that many, many, many people I know who make less money than I do certain would, certainly would. Mm -hmm. You see, so I try to just let that be, um, that's the public's domain. Now, where you're putting your work ends up being related, but that's sort of a different subject. Did that help at all, Tim? Well, I just, I just kind of wondered if in the giant body of work, how much of the people, since the show is strictly functional, how much of the work you thought the, the maker's intent was really married to its functionality and the day-to-day -day use of it? Well, I don't think there's a relationship between strictly functional and day-to-day -day use. Something could be functional. ones I wear every day right. so that's what I'd say about that geez well wow, lots and lots to think about <laughs> <laughs> I, I, man it's so it's so interesting sorry to interject I uh, there's probably somebody else who has some important questions to ask <laughs> wow uh, it looks actually it does look like someone else had some uh, Something smart to say. <laughs> I know. I think you can't really back backpedal out of that, huh? Um, uh, Kevin, what else you got there, my friend? Courtney has a question for Ruth. Courtney, it's, you can. Uh, Courtney, can you take yourself off mute? Yep. There gotcha. you go. Thanks. Uh, this question is for Ruth Easterbrook. Um, I really love the form and background you create for your surface decoration. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the uh, inspirations and process in your, in your work. Sure. Thanks for the question. Um, I, I've long had this relationship of, of thinking about the surface as I make it. And when I was in grad school that became more of this topic to the point that um, it started being that I was setting up my surface as I was making. And so then it is this that the I could like imagine what I wanted to decorate that it would almost kind of push out beyond the edge and become part of the form. Um, and then the the surface is this big challenge that I have um, been on pursuit of for a long time, that it is all glaze. And uh, I want it to have a tension with the surface uh, that shows off all the different characteristics of the glaze. So when you have a, a matte glaze next to a gloss glaze, um, or one that runs, there is this really beautiful thing that happens uh, where the design shifts um, and it's reading with the form in this other dimension. And then I also really love when I can like, you know, inlay a line of high gloss next to a matte glaze, they really play off each other with the light in another way that's very tactile, but uh, like another, a whole nother way of, of experiencing a surface to a, a form too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so Julia, um, mm -hmm. uh, we had a question here. Um, what your students like as it compares to maybe a generational um, taste, if, it, if there is one, or what did they like basically? What my like what kind of pots my students like? Yeah. Is that the What's question? The Can I so that Go was ahead. my question that was my question, Julie. I'm just wondering because you said that you wanted to have a student um cat a student preference category, and I was wondering if their um tastes were what they veered towards. Because it seems like, as I look at everyone, many of us are of a different generation than I'm guessing your students are. So I was sort of wondering if there was a inclination towards something different. Um, I'm not sure about that. I do think they sort of decide what they like and then that makes kind of a track for them. 
like they, they'll decide that like they like atmospheric firing. And then all other kinds of surfaces, they're fine if their friends do it, but they don't want to do it. Like they kind of marry a technique sort of early. And I think that's simply because they're trying to get good at it, you know, because making pots is really hard. And so I think like, um, like some students will just marry inlay. All they want to do is inlay, you know, or some students will marry teapots. And then to try to get them to make a mug is like, holy moly, you know. So um, I don't think that I don't get a sense from them about um, uh, like they like this, they don't like this. I would say myalica is in a little bit of a recession right now. I don't see so much myalica. Um, and uh, I also think that they uh, make forms that are really simple, like this or this or this. Like extreme form is a little bit gone. Um, <clears throat> so I think that's, they, and they also are incredibly influenced by Instagram. You know, if somebody's sort of hot, then they like that work. And then when you kind of dig in there about why they like it, it gets, you know, it can, it can kind of fracture a little bit. But um, I think that uh, they want to find something that they can get good at and feel like they have a bit of an identity with. And then once they kind of hit a level of expertise, then they can sort of start, start sort of fanning out. But one thing I did think about the show quite a bit is that it's not that difficult to make pretty good pots. It's wicked hard to make really good pots. And I feel like they bump into that all the time. Thank you. Seth Green, you got a question for us? You're unmuted. Yeah, yeah I do. Uh, Julia, I, I put it in the chat, but uh, my question is, how have you seen the field evolve over the last 10 years? Know you mentioned the, um, the evolution of the show. Where do you see us in the next, you know, few years? Where do you see us heading? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think our field is just exploding. Like it's just getting humongous. And so um, I think that uh, more techniques are going to come in. I think printing is going to be more prevalent. I think even if you think about slip casting in the last five years, is radically different than it was even five, 10 years ago. So I think that um, there's a real looseness about different techniques and um, sort of expanding that. I think that there's a little bit less of an interest in craftsmanship than there has been in the past, that um, uh, craftsmanship might not be one of the gatekeepers that it has been before. Um, and one thing, I, I'm, I don't really know how to say this, Seth, but I feel like, um, different people have access to different things and as meaning that uh, some people only have access to electric kilns some people have access to a lot of different kinds of kilns some people maybe um, uh, only have access to underglazes with an electric kiln like let's say that's what you have access to and that's it that's going to determine so much of your aesthetic right so i think that um uh, having access to facilities is going to be more and more and more influential over time, especially as I think actually fewer people are making pots in school. So uh, I also think that the shift of the role of the gallery and of the curator um, and us uh, selling work more directly online and in person and sort of like huge uh, sort of amount of these group fairs like, um, like St. Croix like, I think that's gonna have a huge impact on the field. I also think that we never, like when I, like 10 years ago, people would make like maybe 10 different kinds of pots. Like they'd make teapots, pitchers, cream and sugar sets, plates, bowls, right? Now I think uh, the, uh, my students are apt to make like maybe four kinds or maybe three kinds of pots, like mugs, bowls, and one other thing. So I think that the extreme form is getting to be less important and variety of form is getting to be less important. I don't know if that's good or bad. I, it's just what I see. Thank you. Thanks. We have uh, three more questions and then that'll probably do it for time. Is that, does that sound good? Sounds great. Isaac, Isaac, you got a question for us? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I had a question about, um, you know, given the, given the large number of uh, atmospheric pots that that uh, that that have been uh, received for application, 
how did you parse um, intent of Mark or happenstance of Marks on pots versus pots that just happen to be fired in wood kilns or soda kilns? Um, as a person who fires soda and wood pretty regularly um, <laughs> and and as a yeah and, and teaching this kind of thing um, and trying to trying to teach people both how to understand the kilns and and materials while you were looking at the atmospheric work that was uh, <laughs> that, that people applied with like how did you sort all that crap out <laughs> Um, so this friend of mine, Jill Oberman, she always says that work is made or broken on a quarter inch. Like what makes it exceptionally good or not as good is based on a quarter inch on the pot. And um, I kind of think she's right. Um, so basically I took screenshots of most of the atmospheric work that kind of made it in the top 150 um, or even more. And then I, and I kind of put them all on my screen. And then I started to really look at them closely and honestly, good form really took, uh, had much more power um, uh, than I had initially anticipated. So especially when you start to line them up, strong form is still really essential in atmospheric firing. Super the, duper important. Yeah, right? Now, if you're a wild decorator, like this kind of fabulous plate here by, um, by Pamela, like mm -hmm. Good form, not good form, I'm not sure. It doesn't matter to me in that context. <laughs> you know? Because the decoration sort of supersedes the effect. Right, it's all about that. But atmospheric pots are really all about form for the most part. Not, yeah. completely, not completely, but very often. And so that quarter inch ends up being everything. And um, so when trying to figure, so you said something about you're trying to figure out how to bring it to your students' attention. Something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, I was... Uh, trying to trying to help help students understand that um, simply you know putting something in a soda kiln or in a wood kiln doesn't really matter. Um, you could put a brown glaze on it, and uh, it would still just just be a pot with a brown glaze on it, or a pot in a wood kiln. Yeah. So using and understanding the kiln and the material materials you're using are also super important uh, in terms of making making an object that that talks about the intent of loading and the intent of using materials and using the pot to function in a space in the kiln are also pretty important. Yeah, I do think there's this wonderful thing that wood fire potters have figured out about using um, local materials or different kinds of materials and that's really helping wood fire ceramics a lot, right? Huh. Like I think that that's been a pretty brilliant move uh, in the huh. wood fire community. Um, so, okay. Yeah, like, yeah. They, like Perry Haas has really changed the field in that way. Mm -hmm. So, okay, a couple more questions, bring them on and then I'll let you guys go. Nika, you have a question? Who's that? Uh, Kanika just asked, um, oh. our your students interested in other forms of art, painting, sculpture, or are they just in the ceramic studio? Uh, honestly, I think that um, a lot of people that work in ceramics are pretty monogamous. And uh, they're there because they like, the they like the atmosphere of the studio. And then we find this great community in the studio and that keeps us there. And then often, then when we graduate, we go off and we start our own studios and we get a little bit isolated. You know, so that's always a tricky balance in there. But um, I would say for the most part, people in, in my uh, ceramic studio at school, they're pretty monogamous. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it, that's my question. It was, um, so I'll say my name once. It's Konika. Um, and the, the, I, you know, I, I came to pottery because I was a painter. And I was very, very, I, I needed to be in a clean atmosphere without kerosene and hydrochloric mm -hmm. acid and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I brought my, I brought my um, conflicts to a painter I knew who said it's just another substrate. Mm -hmm. Substrate. And I have always thought of it as that. It is a substrate and I use it as that. I also live in Washington, D.C. And I would say that it's where you live that makes you exposed to 
other forms of art. Over here we have the use of the word gallery as being this exclusive thing that you go into the Renwick and the National Gallery and so on and so forth. So I would say the population here of potters do see other forms of art. And I, I merely was asking that about different localities and different regions. It's a pity um, that painting in, in whichever school it is, is not something that uh, a ceramic artist or a potter has to do as well. It's a pity well, that- I, I don't, I, I mean, they have to do a lot of things, but I would say that um, one thing about ceramics, especially wheel throwing, is that it takes mm -hmm. such tremendous skill to develop it that they kind of get a little, you know, they, you know, they're seduced, okay. you know, so it's more mm -hmm. like that. Okay, you guys, just one or two more and then we'll wrap it up. Lane, you have a question? Oh, hi. Yes. Um, you can give me a brief answer because I don't have a lot of time, but as someone that wants a career in ceramics and I haven't been doing this, you know, five, six years now, um, I just, it, from anyone can answer this too, just like tips on how to become more involved and to be, um, get more exposure to, to be able to start a career. I think a lot of a lot of people on this call could answer that. You guys, somebody want to take a stab at it, Bruce? I just just say yeah. that it kind of includes uh, Jim's question: um, who's selling pots during this whole shutdown, and where, and galleries? Question mark, all that kind of stuff. So I think it all ties together. If someone wants to take that on, well, thank you. Yeah, I'll respond to that. I'll respond to that. This is Seth. I think you really just have to show up. You have to apply to everything. You have to go to the visiting artist workshops. You have to go to places like Anderson Ranch Art Center and the Archie Bray and, and uh, take workshops and um, apply to be an intern. You just got to you got to show up. You got to go and get it. You got to be willing to work harder than all of your peers. Yes, I, I can yeah, answer that. I can answer that too. There's an old joke, an old bazooka bubblegum joke. A uh, little boy goes to New York City and he asks the policeman, how do I get to Carnegie Hall? And the policeman says, practice, practice, practice. And uh, Jim Connell was one of my early inspirations at Anderson Ranch mm -hmm. when I was in your shoes. I don't know if you remember that, Jim. Oh, gosh, yes. Uh, everybody, Seth Green was a uh, fire jumper. Is that how you uh, describe it? The person that goes into the forest fires. So I don't know if you want to get back there, but you're doing a great job ceramics wise. Thanks. Lane, I think one thing um, that I've found to be helpful is that you have to figure out a way of interacting with the field that fits your personality. So if you're uh, like super outgoing, then doing a lot of stuff might really work for you. If you're maybe a little bit more of an introvert, then figuring out some other way to enter into the field. So maybe that would be more social media or, um, you know, so I think it's sort of a blend of um, being involved, but being involved in a way that you can be. Yeah, makes sense. Um, I, I might also say that like, what, what kind of career do you want? Um, do you do you want to be a full time um, potter, or do you want to do you want to teach? Or yeah, um, do I don't want to teach in like an academic setting. I think yes. doing workshops um, would be nice, or working for a studio, or just working for myself. Like like I said, I'm I'm new to this um, relatively, so uh, I don't. It could change in three years. I have no idea. Um, I'm kind of just working hard and going with the flow. Yeah, well, it sounds like a that, that's a that's probably like the best plan is to like work hard and just like uh, figure it out as it goes. <laughs> yeah, just whatever opportunities come, I'm I'm just kind of trying to take as many as I can. Say yes or no, and you might get hosed or not, and you know it's just just keep making work. That's if you don't show up, the work's not going to make itself. Yeah. I think, I, the, I think um, I'm just going to jump in here because I think I'm, I'm going to wrap it up. We've been going a little over an hour, but I, I think what I would say is that our field is incredibly supportive and um, supportive of a, 
of emerging artists and people, new career people and um, people who are super established. And I think it's things like Encica and um, the, a lot of our publications are, are really accessible. You know, what I loved is when COVID first started, suddenly everybody was putting up demos to help, um, te help teachers. Like this incredible outpour of support for education. It was just absolutely amazing to me. And, um, you know, the guy who teaches that uh, raw materials class online, he just made it free for everyone. Like, I just think our field is so amazing. I think our field is so amazing. And I, I think I would just wrap up by saying um, that uh, I'm, I have really enjoyed spending six weeks with all of you. And um, there's really some really quite, quite fabulous being, work being made. And I would say um, just to forge ahead and keep, keep on keeping on. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Julia. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. See some faces, and we'll just unmute yourselves and say goodbye, and we'll we'll end it that way. So, thanks again. Take care. And Thank you. Keep Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Julia. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. So thanks. good.